How can faith and reason work together? Are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play in the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and today we're talking about Islam. Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? And I want to remind you that there are many resources just like this podcast available at reasonablefaith.org. Transcripts and recordings of Dr. Craig's debates on college campuses around the world. Articles, questions and answers, a discussion forum, and much more. Available now at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, on top of everybody's mind these days is the subject of Islam. There are a bunch of reasons for that. The atrocities of 9-11 some of the prominence in the world and wars and so forth. Uh, So now more than ever, we seem to be more aware of Islam than uh, in recent memory. Well, I think that we shouldn't underestimate what George Bush Sr. called the change in the new world order that took place with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The central geopolitical reality used to be this opposition between the West, the democratic democracies and then the Soviet bloc countries dominated by Marxism and the the dissolution of the Soviet Union really really did result in a new world order and what's happened in the aftermath of that is that it's resulted in the so-called clash of civilizations between the Muslim world and the democratic West and so that I think is also a contributing factor along with the obvious terrorist attacks and immigration into western nations especially in europe like france and england and the netherlands this has all served to raise the profile of islam in uh, our day and age in a way that gosh just 30 years ago we it wasn't even on the radar screen didn't seem to be and we've discussed the the new atheism in some of our broadcast mm. and uh, a lot of those books that are best sellers these days are a reaction to the terrorist attacks into Islam and saying, this is what religion produces. Yes. That's why faith and religion need to be eradicated. Exactly. That's the difference with the new atheism, by the way, is that they are not content simply to remove religion from the public square, like normal secularists think, but they want it eradicated from society altogether. I, I fear what would happen if these people ever got into power. Uh, because they would be ruthless, I think, in attempting to exterminate religious belief. And a lot of this is prompted, as you say, by radical Islam. And unfortunately, we as Christians get lumped into the mix along with radical Muslims as part of the enemy to be exterminated. As I look at the issue, Bill, it seems that there is the theological issue Christians would deal with, and, and that is the difference in the denial of Jesus as who he claimed to be, But then there's also the political ramifications of their very strict enforcement of their laws and their hatred of the West. And so we seem to have a two-prong attack there, one political and one theological. Let's deal with both. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. On the one hand, there are the profound theological differences between our concepts of God as well as our concept of Christ our doctrines of salvation, our doctrine of sin, all of those are different in Islam and Christianity. But then also on the political front, you've got, for example, the fact that the U.S. is deeply aligned with the state of Israel, and these Muslim nations are committed for the most part to the elimination of Israel, or at least to being enemies with Israel. And so that political reality has also poisoned relations between Muslims and Westerners. What Westerners often try to do is to be real tolerant here and say, look, we're both worshiping the same God. We're just calling him different names. Yeah, I'm I'm just astonished at that. I remember shortly after the terrorist attacks in New York City, Secretary of State Colin Powell was interviewed and, and he said, no wor- great world religion espouses murder And I thought, Secretary Powell, have you never read the ninth surah in the Quran where it enjoins ambush, attack, lying in wait for the unbelievers and exterminating them? It it was evident that for him it was just inconceivable that some great world religion wouldn't hold the same values that we hold dear and, and cherish. And the fact is it's not one world. 
They, there really are different religions that have vastly different value systems than we in the West hold as a result of the influence of Christianity. God and the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus, and Allah seem to have different properties. Uh, yes, and, and Muslims recognize that as well. A faithful Muslim would be just as offended as a conservative Christian in saying, for example, that God is the father of, of Jesus Christ. I remember in the aftermath of 911 at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., one of the ministers began his prayer by saying, God of Abraham, God of Muhammad, father of Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, that offends all the Muslims in the audience as well as Christians, because for a Muslim to say that God is the father of Jesus Christ is blasphemous. This is to commit the most heinous sin possible in Islam, which is the sin called shirk, which means associating something with God, putting something else on the same level as God. For the Muslim God is without peer. He is incomparable. And therefore to say that he has a son is to demean God's status as the incomparable peerless one. And so they condemn unequivocally anybody who believes that Jesus is God's son. So immediately there is such an emotional resistance when there is a dialogue that takes place between Christians and Muslims. It's hard to overcome. to, To say that God is triune is so offensive and so radical to their sensibilities that it's difficult for them to hear anything else after you've said that. Yes, I think you're right. I think it it does touch deep nerves that create anger and resentment. And so it is very difficult to dialogue about these things in a civil way. Let me tell you what's been successful in my own experience. Mm -hmm. And I get your comments on it. But I usually start out when I've talked to some Muslim friends. And this actually keeps the, the emotional wall from coming up too quickly. But I'll say, you know, both you and I believe that there is one God. I believe it, and you believe it. Now, we believe there's something else about God that we call the Trinity, but we both believe, and I reiterate, in one God. Now, that seems to calm things down a little bit and at least give me an opportunity to perhaps explain the Trinity within the oneness of God and so on. But at the same time, I try not to get bogged down on the Trinity. I try to get them to Jesus. Yeah. But the Trinity is going to come up. Sure. But I think you're right, Kevin, is to focus on Jesus. He's the stumbling block, and he's the one I think that we need to to draw them to. And to talk about what the Quran says about Jesus, it says that he was a great prophet. It even calls him the Messiah. Uh, He was born of a virgin. He did miracles. He's coming again. So in all of these ways, the Islam has an exalted view of Jesus, but it doesn't rise to divinity, obviously. And so I think we can we can focus on Jesus. And what we should not do is start attacking Muhammad as a person or calling Muslims terrorists or criticizing the religion in other ways. I think we can be positive and focus upon Jesus and who Jesus was and what he claimed and, and did. And that's really where the the whole issue should be. It should be on Christ. So let's sum that up then. If uh, our Muslim friends ask us about the Trinity, we might can uh, kind of give an answer like I just said, try to establish something that's going to knock down the emotional wall that we both believe in one God. That should settle some nerves. But then try to get it to Jesus as soon as we can because that will help facilitate later talk about the Trinity once we establish some of, of Jesus? Yes, I think that's right. And and we shouldn't forget that the Holy Spirit is at work here. And the Holy Spirit came to glorify Christ and to draw men to him. So when we're talking about Christ, the Holy Spirit is also at work, I think, in drawing people to him. Uh, that's his role. So when we focus on Christ, I think we're right at the heart of the gospel. That is good. There seem to be what we would consider as liberal Muslims who really do want to see some unity among the West and and the Islam world. We want to encourage moderate Muslims who are, as you say, frankly, liberals with respect to their religion. People who adopt, I think, a very non-Islamic stance, namely that church and state should be separate, or mosque and state, we might say. In Orthodox Islam, 
they know nothing of the separation of church and state. Religion and state are all united under the dominance of the religion. But in many Muslim states today, such as Egypt and Jordan and Turkey, you have a separation in effect of church and state and a government that is secular and the mosque operates independently of it. And that's the kind of thing that we want to keep encouraging and, as you say, keep growing and because that will help to, I think, quell the the fanaticism of the orthodox Muslim fundamentalists. But I must say that so long as the United States is aligned with Israel and continues to support Israel, I really am not hopeful that there's going to be an end to this conflict politically. And I, I don't think that the U.S. can back away from Israel. It's a, it's a democracy, one of the few democracies in, in that area. And I think we have every reason to continue to support Israel. It's been a great ally. And as long as we do that, it's hard to see, frankly, that a whole lot of progress and goodwill is going to be generated. At reasonablefaith.org, you have some transcripts and some audio of uh, some debates with some prominent Muslim scholars. Give us a, a thumbnail of some of these debates. How have they gone, and what are some of the issues oh, that come up? It's been such a tremendous privilege and excitement to be involved in these debates. By way of background, when I was doing my theological doctorate in Munich, I had to pick a couple of side areas on which to be examined. And one of the side areas that I picked was Islam, because I had been interested in medieval Muslim theology and philosophy, and so naturally I wanted to specialize more in Islamic thought. So I, I studied Islam extensively and then was examined in it. Well, at that time I never dreamt that someday I would be speaking and debating on this subject, but in the aftermath of 9-1-1, I've had the opportunity to debate Muslim apologists like Jamal Badawi and Shabir Ali on Canadian and American university campuses. And what I found is that the Muslim student associations on university campuses are extremely active in bringing in these Muslim speakers like Badawi and Ali to do Muslim evangelism and encourage the Muslim students there to hold to the faith. And it's interesting, their, re their reaction or their approach is inevitably very rational. The, these Muslim apologists are strongly uh, rational and apologetical in their approach to Islam and Christianity. And some of them know the Bible better than most Christians do, frankly. They quote chapter and verse from memory. Uh, they're familiar with the Jesus Seminar and other biblical critics and exploit the work of people like this, they, they will often like to say even Christian scholars deny that Jesus ever said this, and then they'll quote these liberal Jesus seminar critics and so forth. So um, I've had the chance to debate these fellows, and it's it's been very exciting to do so because what I find in dealing with them is that in talking with a Muslim, it's very much like talking with a radical biblical critic because they basically say the same thing, that Jesus never really said these things, that these are later claims that were invented by the Christian church and then put back onto the lips of Jesus. And so you're basically involved in the same apologetic to a Muslim that you are to one of these liberal critics. You want to use the so-called criteria of authenticity to try to show that certain sayings and events attributed to Jesus in the Gospels were in fact really said by him. And therefore, they cannot be regarded as later corruptions of the oral tradition. These claims were actually made by Jesus. And since the Muslim regards Jesus as a prophet who speaks for God, if he really said these things, then they have to believe him. They have to believe what Jesus claimed about himself. And so that's why I like to really focus on the claims of Christ and then, of course, on his resurrection. As I understand, some of these debates have actually turned pretty emotional with the opponent. And that just kind of shows that these are some emotional issues. From time yeah, to time. you know, most of them, almost all of them, were very calm, very civil. Shabir Ali, in particular, is a thorough gentleman. He is, everybody, all the Christian apologists I know who've debated Shabir like this guy on a personal level. We call him by his first name, Shabir, you know, and... Uh, and uh, he's he's very friendly. Everybody really, really likes him. So he's uh, he's always conducts himself very well in these debates, though he's slippery as an eel 
and very sly. He's very wily. You've got to watch out for him or he'll pick your pocket, so to speak, when you're not looking. But I was in a debate with Jamal Budawi at Texas A&M, and um, to my surprise, he just came became unhinged. And particularly when I made the remark that in the... I didn't think this would get under his skin, but I made the remark that in the Quran, it doesn't actually say that Abraham sacrificed Ishmael on the altar. Uh, Muslims believe it was Ishmael, not Isaac, that Abraham laid on the altar to sacrifice at God's command. And in fact, when you read the Quran, that's not what it says. It says it's Isaac. And I thought, how odd that Islam believes this about Ishmael when in the Quran... It says it was Isaac. And so I just happened to mention this in the debate. And he just went off the charts. He began interrupting and speaking out of turn and, you know, protesting, the, trying to explain this away and so forth. And it was obvious that it touched a real nerve. And I suppose because it strikes right at the heart of who you are as a Muslim, that, that it is Ishmael that is the promised child. And and therefore, it's they who are really the, the chosen people. And I just had no idea that it would do that. For me, it was just an off-the-cuff remark, but it well, really it got something. to him. It shows something. It shows how ingrained this is. You're attacking family heritage. You're attacking uh, culture. You're attacking mm-hmm. the religion, way of life. Just like a Christian, just very deeply ingrained. And in some ways, maybe Islam is even more of a cultural Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Because it is a whole way of life. I mean, for, for Orthodox Islam, as I said, there is no separation of church and state. Everything is under the domination of the religion, the government, the banking system, social mores, education. Everything has to be brought into submission to Allah. That's what Islam means, submission. And a Muslim is one who is in submission in every area of his life. So, I mean, in one sense, Muslims have a lot to teach us as Christians about total submission to God. I think as Christians, we are called upon, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to be totally sold out to God, body and soul, laid on his altar as living sacrifices. And in that sense, we, I think, agree with the Muslim in this notion that we are to be, in our lives personally, totally submitted to God. But they extend it beyond the personal life to society as a whole, and they're submitted to a quite different God. That's that's the problem. The Christian will often say, one of the evidences for the truth of Christianity is, look how it spread after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, the skeptic will come back and say, well, then how do you explain the spread of Islam and how popular that has become? Right. And for that reason, I don't think that that's a good argument for Christianity. Uh, One could also point out Mormonism, which has, in the hundred or so years since Joseph Smith lived, has spread to become really a new world religion. Mormonism is emerging as a new religion world religion, in addition to Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, and so forth. So the fact that Christianity spread quickly in the Mediterranean world and then even beyond isn't a good argument for its truth. I think that the germ of truth in that argument is the following, and this is what I've used in my own work. What is to be explained about Christianity is not its rapid spread, but its very origin Christianity had its origin in the belief of these earliest disciples that God had raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Now, that is a totally un-Jewish belief, not to say an outlandish belief. How do you explain the origin of that belief on the disciples' part? And I think when you look at the possible explanations, namely, it's a Christian retrojection or it's from pagan mythology, or it's from Jewish influences, none of those provides a plausible explanation of why the disciples came to believe such an un-Jewish and outlandish thing as that God raised Jesus from the dead, so that the very origin of the Christian movement cries out for some sort of an explanation in the fact of the resurrection itself. And one could use a similar argument for Islam, that uh, given the origin of Islam in the mid-7th century A.D., there must have been some historical events that brought it about. And I think that's quite true. There there must have been a historical Muhammad who probably had some kind of a vision of God, who was offended by polytheism and began to proclaim that there is only one true God. So... That's right. I think it applies in both cases, that you have to have a historically adequate cause 
to explain the sudden origin of a movement that is quite different from anything that preceded it. One of the differences between the spread of Christianity and the spread of Islam seems to be the sword. Well, yeah, that's true, I guess. <laughs> Do you want to mention that? <laughs> well, yeah, that's worth mentioning, isn't it? I mean, Christianity during the first three centuries of its existence was this tiny persecuted religion that often was punctuated by horrible martyrdoms. Its growth was watered by the blood of these martyrs. By contrast, Islam was spread by military conquest. Just two years after the death of Muhammad, the Arabian forces invaded Persia and brought in into submission. Then Syria fell a year or so later. Then Jerusalem fell. And after that, Egypt. And then these Islamic armies swept right across North Africa all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. So it was by conquest that Islam was spread. And this is part of the doctrine of Islam. As I mentioned earlier in the ninth chapter of the Quran, it enjoins violence against pagans in order to bring them into submission, and even violence against the so-called people of the book, that is to say Jews and Christians, uh, until they are brought into submission too. Islam, Kevin, divides the whole world into two camps. One is called the Dar al-Islam, and the other is called the Dar al-Harb. And that means the house of submission. Those are the lands or nations that are brought into submission to Islam. The house of submission, the other, is called the house of war. And those are the lands that have not yet been brought into submission to Islam. And this perception of the world is in these two camps, the house of submission, the house of war, speaks volumes about the nature of Islam and its command to bring the world by force, if necessary, into submission to Allah. In summation, Dr. Craig, we don't worship the same God. We don't agree theologically on the nature of God, but we want to try to get Jesus front and center in his claims when we deal with Islam. That's exactly right. Paul in preaching the gospel, said, I determined to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. And just as that was folly to Gentiles and a stumbling block to Jews, it is also the stumbling block for Muslims as well. And, and therefore, like Paul, we need to point our hearers, when they're Muslims, to the person of Christ. Our question of the day, Dr. Craig, are Christianity and science compatible? Well, I'm persuaded that they are compatible. Certainly there are areas of conflict that uh, do arise from time to time, but I think that in the course of time, these conflicts will be resolved. And so in various areas that I've worked on, such as relativity theory and cosmology, there I think one sees that a religious perspective on these issues can shed real light on science. I think that religion can learn from science and I think that science can learn from religion, so that there are a number of ways in which these two interact with each other that can be helpful. Science is not the only way to gain knowledge. Many people think that that's the case. That's a really good point. I, no, I think that that is not science. That's scientism, the view that only through scientific exploration can knowledge be gained. That itself is not a scientific claim. That is a philosophical claim, so that it would be self-defeating if it were made. The very claim that you can only know truth through science isn't a scientifically provable claim, so it would be self-defeating. There are other avenues to truth besides science, and there are other types of knowledge besides scientific knowledge, such as mathematical knowledge, logical knowledge, ethical knowledge, aesthetic knowledge, metaphysical knowledge, even many scientific truths cannot be proven scientifically. So while science is one avenue to truth, and a, uh, perhaps the best way to find out truth about the empirical world, nevertheless there's lots of truth that is not scientifically accessible that we can know by other means. And Dr. Craig, there is a fear of science, even among people who think that science is the only way to truth, and it shows up in science fiction movies, and that is that science, or the advance of science and scientific discoveries, can be used against man. This is because science is ethically neutral. You cannot discover moral values in a test tube. So science is amoral. That's not to say it's immoral. It's amoral. It's simply morally neutral. 
so that the same scientific discovery that can be used to fuel nuclear reactors and and light a city can be used to make a bomb that could destroy that city. And that's why we mustn't simply leave science unchecked by ethical considerations. We cannot allow science to just do whatever is scientifically possible. There need to, I think, be ethical and moral considerations upon what we allow science to do. For more resources like these from Dr. William Lane Craig, go to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. How can faith and reason work together? Are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play in the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and today we're talking about Islam. Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? And I want to remind you that there are many resources just like this podcast available at reasonablefaith.org. Transcripts and recordings of Dr. Craig's debates on college campuses around the world. Articles, questions and answers, a discussion forum, and much more. Available now at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, in speaking of Islam, there are profound political differences and profound theological differences. So we have problems in two major and very emotional areas. As I understand Sharia law, it doesn't allow much freedom to non-Muslims who are under Muslim control. So were they to take over, we can kiss our religious freedom goodbye. Well, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. In countries that were under Islamic control, Christians and Jews were permitted to exist and to practice their religion, but they were called dimini. They were persons who were rather second-class citizens. They were subservient, and so they certainly were denied certain rights. And that's true in, for example, Muslim Spain when they controlled the Iberian Peninsula, uh, as well as in other countries such as Syria where there were significant Christian congregations. So this subservience of other religions to Islam is a simple fact of history, and you're absolutely right that were they to take over control, our freedoms would be significantly curtailed. Am I to understand that there is even a tax imposed on the non-Muslim? Yeah, that's absolutely right. There's a sort of alms tax that the demini had to pay that would um, substitute, in a sense, for their converting to Islam. If you convert, then you don't have to pay the tax. (laughs) (laughs) Good benefit there. Yeah, all sorts of incentives. The violence that we've seen among terrorists, the beheadings that have just so disturbed the nation, suddenly we can, for the first time in history, have access to actual videos of these things. Hmm. That is kind of a cyber terrorism in one way, in that you're so disquieted by those images and by that murder being captured and then spread where millions of people, teenagers and children, see it. Is there something within the genesis of Islam that facilitates that kind of violence? I myself haven't viewed and would not view these sorts of videos. I think that would be inappropriate. But I think it it certainly is true that within Islam itself, there is an injunction to use violence in the propagation of the faith, that jihad is not simply a moral and spiritual struggle, it's also a military struggle to bring all the world into submission to Islam. And uh, I've been told by folks who work with Muslims, who are familiar with Muslim culture and so forth, that these beheadings are actually done in the way in which an an animal would be sacrificed. It it is a kind of ritual offering to slit the throats of these victims in this way, so that this isn't a sort of a religious act that's being performed when these people are sacrificed, as it were. I want to touch on that for just a moment. I didn't watch those beheadings either that were, were so prominent on the Internet. Millions of people... Millions of people did. Mm. Teenagers gathered at one another's homes and watched them. Radio stations played the audio. Now, 
One of the reasons that I didn't succumb to the curiosity, or even for investigational purposes, is that the radio stations around the building where I work were playing the audio really? from those beheadings until they were finally got enough complaints that they stopped. But I heard them, Bill, mm -hmm. and it disturbed me profoundly hearing the audio. So I certainly wasn't going to add fuel to the fire by going deeper into the horror of that by viewing it for a morbid reason. But you exactly. said it was in inappropriate. Is this right? I, I think that's right. As a Christian, we're to avoid evil. We're to to think on those things that are lovely, true, good, and upbuilding, and to yield to this sort of macabre curiosity is to yield to our lower nature, really, Kevin. It is to indulge in a kind of voyeurism that is, I think, very sinister and, and really wicked. It, it's not the better part of our nature. And so I think for the Christian, we need to exercise discipline here, as you did, and say, I'm not going to let my curiosity get the better of me and compel me to do things that wouldn't be a building to me as a Christian. It would be sufficient to be aware of it without going ahead and then indulging it or wallowing in it. Exactly. You don't have to experience it yourself to be aware that this has happened and be aware of what was done. You know, it's the same principle that I, I don't go and see slasher movies where people are having their limbs cut off with chainsaws and things of that sort. There's no reason that I, as a Christian, want to fill my mind with this kind of thing. Even pretend, even fake, you know, when it's just fake blood and makeup, uh, much less a real beheading as in this case. What I hear you saying is that when the Muslim is engaging in violence and violent acts, he's being fairly consistent with Islam and with the Quran. If the critic were to point to Christianity and say, yeah, but look at the Crusades and the Inquisition, look at the violence that done in the name of Christ and in the name of God and so forth. There's violence there. Mm -hmm. I hear you saying that the former would be consistent with the teaching. Christianity engaging in violence would be inconsistent with the teaching. Exactly. Jesus would not have engaged in violence as a means of evangelism or in the use of violence to uh, conquer other peoples. You, you always have to go back to Jesus and say, what would he have done? Would he have been a guard at Auschwitz? Would he have participated in the Crusades and sacked Byzantium? Well, I think the answer is just evidently no. By contrast, would Muhammad have done these things? Well, yes, he did do these things. He was a, a caravan raider and participated in campaigns of violence and war, and not just defensive ones either, as, as Muslims might sometimes claim. And uh, when he died, he died with plans on the table for attacks upon neighboring nations. And after his death, his successors carried out those attacks successfully. So Whereas violence is consistent with Islam and the example and teaching of Muhammad, it is inconsistent with Christianity and the example and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's the huge difference. Seems to be a difference between some of the surahs as well, the early surahs and the later surahs. Some Muslim scholars point out that at first, Muhammad wanted to do it the peaceful way, and let's all get mm -hmm. together, and by the way, I'm right, and uh, this is the nature of God, and polytheism is wrong. When that wasn't as readily received as he had hoped, then he went another route. That, that's absolutely right. And what we need to understand is that the Quran is not a unified volume. This is a book that is a compilation of materials that were written over quite a long stretch of time. And so they reflect different historical realities. And when Muhammad began, he was a persecuted prophet of monotheism, living in Mecca in a rampantly polytheistic culture. And the early Muhammad was a pretty great guy in terms of what he was proclaiming, uh, that there is only one God and that all these false gods are untrue and, and, and so forth. And um, one can be very sympathetic with him. And in fact, while he was in the persecuted minority, he was very friendly toward the people of the book. That is to say, people who believed in the Bible, Jews and Christians. And it's those passages in the Quran, passages from that period of Muhammad's life, that are cited by uh, moderate Muslims to show 
that the attitude of Islam toward other religions, and Christianity and Judaism in particular, is very peaceful and conciliatory and so forth. That's absolutely correct at that early period of Muhammad's life. But after he moved to Medina, where he gained political and military power, then the persecuted minority prophet of monotheism turned into the political machine operative and and manipulator and became ruthless and began to persecute the Jews to kill them and uh, ultimately issued these commands to bring pagans into submission by violence and even to attack the people of the book. And that's reflected in uh, like the ninth surah. That's right, in the ninth surah, which is some of the latest or last material that was written in the Quran. Beleaguer them, lie in wait for them. Ambush Uh, them wherever you find them. Muhammad also seemed to have disdain for a version of the Trinity that was circulating at the time. That is, he thought that mm. Mary was a part of the Trinity, and so it seems like he's the genesis of Islam is attacking the wrong Trinity. Right. That's also extremely interesting. Muhammad apparently never had any first-hand acquaintance with the New Testament. He was getting all of this secondarily by word of mouth, and he apparently thought that because Christians at that time were referring to Mary as the mother of God, as Catholics and Orthodox do today, Mary the mother of God, he thought that the doctrine of the Trinity meant that God the Father copulated with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and that Jesus was the offspring of of their union, so that the Trinity was composed of God the Father, Mary the mother of God, and Jesus the Son of God. Well, of course he regarded such a doctrine as blasphemous and sacrilegious, but this is a doctrine that no sane Christian would hold to, so that, in fact, it's it's a caricature of Christianity that is rejected in the Quran. So let's contrast, then, the Muslim concept of God and the Christian, in the New Testament concept of God. One is a very strict monotheism, only one God, and uh, and then the God of the Bible is one God, but he is a trinity. Yes, I would say that both of them are strict monotheisms. They are both uh, committed to the existence of one and only one God, and we mustn't yield to the Muslim claim that we believe in three gods. That's simply not true. There, we, we both agree that there is only one God. The difference between Christianity and Islam with respect to God is not monotheism, it's Unitarianism. Muslims or Islam is a form of Unitarianism, which says that there is only one person who is God, whereas Christianity is Trinitarian. It believes that there are three persons who are are God. And so the real debate isn't here. It isn't about monotheism. It's about Unitarianism and which is the true concept of God. Which makes more sense philosophically, do you think? A Unitarian God or a a triune God when we think of things like eternity and Mm -hmm. and the attributes of God? Well, on the one hand, I think that there's undoubtedly a kind of appeal to Unitarianism in that it seems simpler to just say there's one person that God is. And, And I think that makes Unitarianism appealing. On the other hand, I think when you contemplate, as you said, the attributes of God, we have some pretty persuasive reasons to think that God is not simply one person. And one of the things I'm thinking about here is that God is essentially all-loving. It is essential to the very nature of God to be all-loving, because love is a moral perfection, and God is a morally perfect being. Now, if God is all-loving, then whom does he love if this is essential to him? Well, it can't be just created beings because created beings don't exist essentially. Creation is a freely willed act of God, not something he had to do. So there are possible worlds. By that I mean it's possible, logically, to conceive of God existing alone, with no creation. He chose not to create at all. And in such an empty universe, so to speak, God would still be essentially all-loving. Or even in this world in which God has created persons whom he loves, Nevertheless, those persons haven't been around all the time. They, they are finite in their existence. A, a, a certain number of years ago, there were no human beings yet. And so it cannot be that created persons are the persons whom God loves essentially. If God is essentially all-loving, then whom is it that he loves? 
Well, it seems to me there must be a plurality of persons within God himself. It is the very nature of love to give oneself away, to give oneself to the other. And if God is just a single person indulged in self-love, this would be contrary to the nature of love. It would just be a kind of narcissism. But if God is a trinity of persons, then there is this giving away of oneself in love to the other that goes on between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from eternity. And so I think that when you think about the nature of God as self-giving love, that that gives powerful grounds for thinking that God is not just a single person in love with himself, but that God is a, a trinity of persons. That makes a lot of sense. And the nature of love itself, it's reciprocal as well as something that you give. Well, that's you know? true, too. You receive love, and so that would also imply a plurality of persons. The God of Islam seems to be rather arbitrary mm-hmm. in his decisions, and we don't find that in the, the God of the Bible. What, uh, what are the differences there in that arbitrary, capricious nature? It seems to me, Kevin, that what's going on here is that in Islam, God's attribute of being omnipotent or almighty or all-powerful trumps everything else. That's the way I understand it. In Christianity, we believe that God has a number of essential attributes, such as love, holiness, justice, omnipotence, uh, omnipresence, um, eternity, necessity, and all of these are essential attributes of God. None of them can be compromised. They, They cannot be suppressed one for the sake of another. They're all essential to God. And and cannot be denied. But in Islam, it's quite different. It seems that in Islam, God's being all-powerful or almighty trumps everything, even his own moral character, so that in Islam, God can deceive people. He can lie to them. He can do things that are morally wrong, even contrary to his own nature, because he's all-powerful. And so this results in a sort of arbitrary, capricious God, whose sheer power knows no bounds, not even the bounds of his own character. So for a Muslim, it is possible that on the judgment day, God could say to everybody, ah, so you thought that by saying the confession that I am the only God and Muhammad is my prophet, that I would save you. Well, it was all a trick. You're all going to hell. In fact, I'm going to save all the Jews instead of you Muslims. And he would send all the Muslims to hell. And that's entirely within God's prerogative and power on Islam. So there's absolutely nothing to constrain God from just sheer arbitrary caprice. It's the it's the sheer will to power. The Muslims realize that. I mean, mm. they actually treat God and acknowledge God in that way. Oh, yeah. They even acknowledge that if you fly your plane into a building in the ultimate martyrdom, you're still not guaranteed. No, there is yes. no guarantee in Islam of salvation because, as I say, at the last minute, God could decide simply to damn you or, or anybody, no matter what he has said before, because he's not bound by his own word or character. How is that not representational of the Christian God? Well, in Christianity, we have the notion that God is essentially loving, he's essentially fair, he's essentially truthful. And to say something is essential, in case our, our listeners don't understand that, that means it's necessarily so, that he, he cannot go against his own moral character of being loving, fair, uh, truthful, and so forth. So it's impossible for God to do these things. Now, that's not because there's some constraint outside of God, but it is because his own character is such that it determines the way he will act. One of the most telling things about Islam is that they don't regard God as Father, and Christianity does. Of the 99 names for God in Islam, none denote Father, Yet Jesus said that we should call him Father. So, do Muslims not regard God as Father? I've never heard God referred to in that way. Now, I don't know Muslim traditions, the so-called Hadith, well enough to, to know whether it would appear there. But if Jesus could not call God Father, could not be the Son of God, then it would certainly seem impossible for us to do so, because that would be to commit shirk again, to put yourself on a plane where you're somehow comparable with God. So God for the Muslim is is wholly other. He, he's quite removed and distant and other than we are. I remember once sharing with a Muslim about God's love for us. 
And I thought this would appeal to him to think that God really loves us. And he said, for him as a Muslim, he said the thought was just absurd. He said it would be like my loving ants and having a, a love relationship with ants. That's how removed God is from us as people for him, except even infinitely more so. So there isn't that sort of personal relationship with God as your heavenly father. More like a master-slave um Employer, employee. Well, I um, think that would be appropriate because the notion of Islam is submission. It's this sort of unquestioned, total submission to God as your master. So master-slave wouldn't be an inappropriate analogy so long as you don't think of the master as being uh, a cruel master. Islam thinks that God is all-compassionate and all-loving to Muslims, to those who are submitted to him. He will be compassionate and merciful and so forth. How would Allah view non-Muslims? Well, this was one of the most remarkable things that I discovered when I first began to read the Quran years ago. I began to notice over and over again in the Quran, it says, whom God does not love. God does not love unbelievers. God does not love sinners. God does not love the stiff-necked. God does not love the, the reprobate. Over and over again, it described whom God does not love. And it was very clear that according to the Quran, God has no love for non-Muslims. He has no love for unbelievers. The promise of the Quran is that if you come to God, submit to him, make the confession, obey him, and live as a life of a Muslim, then God will give you love. If you live up to his standard, then he will love you. In other words, God only loves those who love him first. And it struck me how contrary this is to the teaching of Jesus. Jesus said, if you only love those who love you, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the pagans do the same and the tax collectors do the same. The love of Allah in the Quran rises no higher than the love that Jesus said even pagans and tax collectors exhibit. The God of the Bible, the God of the New Testament, is a God who loves sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, he, he died for us. And God so loved the world that he gave, the New Testament says. And so this is, I think, one of the most startling contrasts between the Quran and the New Testament, is that the Quran teaches that God only loves those who are Muslims, who come to him and love him first, whereas the New Testament says God loves sinners, loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them. Dr. Craig, our question of the day, Mark Twain said that faith is the believing and what you know ain't so. What is a good working definition of faith? Well, I think Martin Luther analyzed faith very well into three essential components. First is faith as understanding. In order to believe something, you must first understand what it means. Second would be assent, when you agree, yes, that is true. And then the third element of faith would be trust or commitment, where you come to place your trust in something or someone because you have assented to its truth. So all three of those elements would be involved in faith in the fullest sense. And would that apply as well to faith in the Christian sense? Oh, yes, I think quite definitely. For example, faith in Christ. First, you need to understand the message of the gospel, then you need to not only understand it, you need to assent to it. You do believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for your sins, who rose from the dead. But it's not enough just to believe those truths. You need then to make a commitment of your life to him as Savior and Lord in order to be related to him by saving faith. So saving faith is not just intellectual assent. It's also that whole-souled commitment of the heart to the person whom you believe to be the truth. For more resources like these from Dr. William Lane Craig, go to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. How can faith and reason work together? Are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play in the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and today we're talking about Islam. Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? And I want to remind you that there are many resources just like this podcast available at reasonablefaith.org. 
transcripts, and recordings of Dr. Craig's debates on college campuses around the world, articles, questions and answers, a discussion forum, and much more. Available now at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, we've talked about some of the political clashes among Westerners and Islam. We've been also concentrating on very crucial theological differences that just cause walls to often come up in dialogue between Christians and Muslims. A couple of those things are really prominent. One is the nature of God and uh, the Trinity, and the other is who Jesus is, Mm -hmm. his divinity. With respect to the nature of God, the most fundamental issue would be the difference between Unitarianism and Trinitarianism. Islam is a form of Unitarianism. It says there is one person that God is. On Christianity, by contrast, we believe that there are three persons that God is. In addition to that, there are certain attributes of God, I think, that are quite different in Islam and Christianity. For example, in Christianity, God is conceived to be all-loving and morally perfect, whereas in Islam, God is not all-loving. He only loves Muslims, those who are submitted to him. So with respect to God, there's both differences with regard to Unitarianism versus Trinitarianism, as well as with regard to some of his attributes. It's very offensive for our Muslim friends to consider God as being in some way triune. So let's discuss the Trinity for just a moment. How is God only one God, but there are three persons who are the one God? Well, as I understand the Trinity, we want to say that there are three centers of self-consciousness in God. And by that, I mean there are three persons who can say, I think that. Uh, Just as in my being, there is one center of self-consciousness that I call I, me, myself. In God, there are three centers of self-consciousness. And we call them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because of the different roles that they play in the plan of salvation. It is the Father who sends the Son to be incarnate. It is the Holy Spirit who, in the church age, ministers in the place of the Son and equips the church and empowers her for Christian life and work. So they have different roles in the economy of salvation. And so there, this is sometimes called the economic trinity, which would be the different roles played by these three persons in the plan of salvation. But in terms of the trinity itself, these are three co-equal persons who are all omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, have all of the superlative attributes of God and therefore are God. So there are three persons who are the one God. Mm -hmm. And because something isn't easy to understand, does that uh, make it false? (laughs) Not at all. That's a loaded question, I know. Sure, of course. uh, You'd have to demonstrate some sort of logical incoherence in the doctrine of the Trinity. But I don't think there is any such logical incoherence. The doctrine of the Trinity is not the incoherent doctrine that three gods are somehow one God or that three persons are somehow one person. Rather, it is that there are three persons in the one God. And that's not contradictory. No, that's not in any way contradictory. And when you understand that what the Quran rejects is not that doctrine of the Trinity, but a caricature of it, namely that the Trinity is composed of God the Father, Mary, the mother of God, and their offspring, Jesus, then I don't see that the Muslim really has any substantive objection to the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not as though we're placing something on God's level that is not God, which would be sacrilege or blasphemy to associate something that is not God with God himself. We're not doing that. We're saying, rather, within the Godhead itself, there is a plurality. There are three centers of self-consciousness in God. The skeptic will often try to attack the Genesis are the origin of the doctrine of the Trinity and saying, oh, come on, somebody came up with that at some council Mm. or something. How did we discover or determine the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, I did a master's degree in uh, church history and the history of Christian thought, and I can say pretty confidently that that skeptical representation is just ignorance of church history. What the Council of Nicaea did was simply to ratify what the church had believed right from New Testament times, namely that Jesus Christ is God. He is equal to the Father. And you find that in the New Testament itself. Not only 
are the attributes of deity predicated of Jesus in the New Testament. And not only is Jesus called Lord, which translates the Greek word for Yahweh, the name of God in the Old Testament, but in certain places in the New Testament, Jesus is actually explicitly called God. For example, in uh, John chapter 20, where Thomas falls at Jesus' feet and says, my Lord and my God. And there are other confessions like that as well. So right from the New Testament, Jesus is called God and thought to be co-equal with the Father. And it was only when certain persons began to deny this doctrine that the church rose up and said, we need to make an official declaration that these people are heretics, that this is in fact incompatible with Christianity. And that's why then the Council of Nicaea formulated and and ratified the Nicene Creed so as to make very clear that anyone who denied this doctrine was denying fundamental Christian truth. So we're not dependent upon later councils or formulations. We can go right to the New Testament and find there, I think, the affirmation of the deity of Christ. Now, when we get to the deity of Christ, this is also very offensive to our Muslim friends because they believe that that is the blasphemy of shirk? Yes, to associate something with God. And again, I I would say that would only be that if you thought Jesus was merely human. But of course, that's not the Christian doctrine. The view of Jesus is that he is God incarnate, that is to say God in the flesh, and that therefore Christ is truly God as well as truly human. That is the affirmation of the Nicene Creed, that He is both. He is truly God and truly man. We have a big fancy term for that, the hypostatic union. Yes, I think it's it's a good term. The idea of a hypostasis in Greek, that literally means, hypo means under, like in a, say, for example, a hypodermic needle. Hyperdermic means under the skin. Dermic, like dermatology, that's the skin. So hypodermic is under the skin. Uh, and so this means under, and then stasis is the Greek word for stand. So a hypostasis is something that stands under. It is the Greek equivalent, really, of the Latin word substance. A substance is sub, under, stance, stand. So a hypostasis or a substance, is something that stands under and bears properties. It is a property bearer. And so when we say that in Christ there are two natures in one substance, what we mean is there is one property bearer who has both divine properties and human properties. He has all the properties that go to make up a divine nature, and he has all the properties that go to make up a human nature. And so this hypostasis or or individual, is a property bearer that has a a divine and a human nature and is therefore truly human and truly divine. So the idea of the hypostatic union is that these two are united in one person. Two natures in In one one person. person. Right. A rational hypostasis is a person. A hypostasis is, in a sense, an individual, a property bearer. A rational hypostasis is what we would call a person. When I hear dialogues between Muslims and Christians, the issue comes up of the divinity of Christ quite often. If he were God, then who was he praying to in the garden? Who was he crying out to from the cross, which we'll get into here in just a moment? Mm -hmm. And uh, why did he not know all things and so forth? Yes. It's been said that doing Muslim evangelism is a crash course in Christian doctrine. And I think that's quite right. Muslims don't understand the doctrine of the two natures of Christ. So they think that in proving that Christ had these human attributes like limited knowledge, praying to God the Father, growing in moral perfection, being weak and physically exhausted, even being limited in time and space, Christians agree with all of those because we think Jesus was truly human. He had a truly human nature. That doesn't prove that he didn't also have a truly divine nature in addition to that. So The Christian is unmoved by all of these proof texts that the Muslim brings from the Gospels to show that Jesus was limited and human in all these ways because we recognize that. What the Muslim doesn't understand is that we believe Christ had two natures, so that in addition to these human properties, he also had 
properties like omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and so forth. Paul seems to shed some real light on this. The second chapter of his letter to the Philippians, he talks about that Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not grasp after that equality with God, but but became a servant and mm-hmm. became obedient. It's like he limited his rights as God, perhaps allowed them to be, what, veiled? I think that would be fair. What we don't want to say is that he gave up his divine attributes, because if he gave up his essential divine properties, he would cease to be God, and that would not be the doctrine of the Incarnation, which is that Jesus is simultaneously God and man. Not that he was first God and then became man and then became God again, so that he was sequentially God and man. The the doctrine of the Incarnation is that Jesus is simultaneously God and man. But certainly in this state of emptying that Paul talks about, this state of humiliation, Christ didn't draw upon and display all of his divine attributes openly. So, as you say, he was ignorant of certain facts like the date of the second coming. Now, I think he actually knew those insofar as he was divine, but insofar as he had a human uh, conscious life, Um, He didn't have that knowledge uh, at his disposal. This was, as you say, veiled or restrained in some way. It would be incoherent to say that Jesus somehow emptied himself of divinity because God is not something that can be emptied. Well, that's right. It would be like saying that God could cease to exist, which is logically impossible because God is a necessary and eternal being. So it's logically impossible for God to cease to be God, and therefore the, the notion that Jesus somehow gave up his divinity when he became man is really it's a pagan idea frankly kevin it it's similar to zeus in greco-roman mythology turning himself into a swan or turning himself into a bull uh for a temporary period of time that kind of metamorphosis is really a pagan idea that is completely foreign to the christian doctrine of the incarnation we need to chase the incarnation here for just a moment Awesome, wonderful doctrine of the Bible, incarnation. Let's spell some of the things out there for it, Bill, because uh, often we find ourselves talking about what it, it is not uh-huh. as, a, as well as what yes. it is. Right. I think that the proper way to think of the incarnation is not as some kind of subtraction. It's not as though the second person of the Trinity subtracted or gave up some of his attributes and turned himself into a human being. That is a completely foreign idea to Christianity. The way to think of the Incarnation is as a matter of addition, that in addition to the divine nature that he already had, the second person of the Trinity took on a human nature as well, so that now instead of one nature, which was divine, he had two natures, one of which was divine that he's had from eternity, and a human nature which he assumed at the moment of the virginal conception in Mary's womb. So not the subtraction of deity, but the addition of humanity. humanity. Right. Did you come up with that, Bill? Mm, I don't think so. (laughs) I think that's just good orthodox doctrine. (laughs) Okay. See, the incarnation wasn't like uh, a possession. God possessed a human, it seems to go beyond that. Yeah, that's a uh, very with, good with point. Humanity. Right. In in the doctrine of, say, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we believe that God lives within Christians, that he indwells us. Or in demon possession, we think of a spiritual being that's taken control of the body of some other person. But the union of Christ with his human nature is much more intimate than that. It's not a mere as you say, possession or indwelling of God in the man, Jesus of Nazareth. No, we want to say that the person who was Jesus, that person had two natures, one a human nature and one a divine nature. So you have a divine person with a human nature and a divine nature. Even after the resurrection and his ascension, as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now, and when we see him one day uh, at his second coming and so on, Is he still going to be that God-man? Is he still going to be that incarnation, that uh, two natures? Yes, that's one of the intriguing things about Christianity, and and I think the doctrine of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ show that the possession of a human nature was not merely a temporary thing that the second person of the Trinity did for 30 years in order to secure our salvation and then gave up. Rather, the resurrection and ascension of Christ 
show that the Incarnation is a permanent state of the second person of the Trinity, and it is an affirmation, I think, of human being, of the worth of human being, and of the worth of the material world as well, that the second person of the Trinity should take on this sort of a material existence and take it on into eternity forever. So when Jesus prayed to the Father and he obeyed the Father and he listened to the Father and so on, he's doing that as a man. That's right. We see in the Gospels the humanity of Christ on display. And it's only occasionally that glimpses of his divinity will come through. For example, in the Transfiguration or in moments of clairvoyant knowledge or perhaps miracles but for the most part, you see the man, Jesus, walking about Palestine, teaching people to obey God, the Father, praying to God himself, suffering, dying. It's the humanity of Jesus that tends to be on display there in the Gospels. How do Muslims view the crucifixion of Christ? This is one of the, I think, most tremendous ironies of Islam, that of all the facts about Jesus to deny they pick the one fact which is the most indisputable fact about Jesus of Nazareth that is acknowledged by every historical scholar today, namely his crucifixion. According to the Quran, Jesus uh, was not crucified. This was a lie. It says that it only seemed to the Jews that they had crucified him. And later Muslim tradition interpreted this to mean that somebody else was made to look like Jesus and was crucified in his place. And uh, some Muslim tradition says it was Judas uh, Iscariot, that God had somehow changed his appearance so that he looked like Jesus. And he was crucified in the place of Jesus, and Jesus was assumed into heaven uh, so that he was never crucified. So Islam wants to spare Jesus the humiliation and the suffering and the death of the crucifixion, it denies the passion of the Christ, in effect. And as I say, it's ironic that it should do that, because this is the one fact about Jesus of Nazareth that everybody who studies Jesus acknowledges. So the crucifixion and the resurrection are just out the window when it comes to Islam. That's right. Obviously, if Jesus didn't die on the cross, then he wasn't raised from the dead either. So they deny the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, which, of course, are central to Christian belief. I think you begin to see how different Islam is from Christianity because that means there's no atonement for sin. There's no substitutionary death on our behalf. There's no resurrection of Christ to vindicate his atoning sacrifice. So this means the doctrine of salvation in Islam and Christianity is completely different because Christ doesn't give his life for us as a sacrificial offering to God because they deny the fact of the crucifixion. In wrapping up today, Bill, it appears a good response to our Muslim friends, not only to be loving, but also a defense of the resurrection of Jesus might go a long way. Yes, I think that when we focus on the resurrection, you're not only at the heart of the gospel, but you're also on very solid historical ground. Because, as I say, the vast, vast majority of New Testament scholars, not evangelicals, not conservatives, but the, the mainstream of New Testament scholarship, agrees that Jesus of Nazareth was executed by Roman authority, by crucifixion around Passover time, that thereafter he was given an honorable burial in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, that thereafter his tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers, that various groups and individuals then experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead, and that the earliest disciples despite every predisposition to the contrary, came to believe suddenly and sincerely that God had raised Jesus from the dead. And those facts, I think, go to undergird the belief that Jesus died and was raised by God from the dead, and therefore Christianity is true and Islam is, in fact, false. Our question of the day, Dr. Craig, if God knows what we need before we pray, well then, why pray? So that we'll get what we need. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's the idea. He knows what you need before you ask him, but you got to ask him. And therefore, prayer, I think, uh, moves the hands of God. God will do things in answer to prayer that he would not have done had we not prayed. Now, that doesn't mean that we change God's mind, and maybe that's what's behind the question here. 
Prayer doesn't change God's mind because he knows what you need before you ask him, and he knows that you will pray. But prayer has an effect in the sense that were we not to pray, then God would not have moved in the way that he will. Seems like we participate with God in in prayer. It's a way for him to allow us to participate with him in some way. Oh, very much so. It really means that we cooperate with God in bringing about certain events and effects in the world. I can't see God changing his mind. There are some biblical descriptions that seem to indicate that he changed his mind. How are we to understand those? Well, I think they need to be read in the broader context where the scriptures say that God knows the end from the beginning. He He knows uh, uh, the words that I'm going to speak even before they're on my tongue. Uh, he prophesies the future. Uh, and, and in these accounts, I think we need to understand that the Bible is largely a storybook. It's a story of narratives. And these narratives are told from the human point of view and therefore have all the color and vivacity of the storyteller's art. And so they'll portray God as repenting on something or as asking questions like, uh, I'm going to go down to Sodom and see if the report that I have heard is really true. Well, that, that's just a, a kind of human storyteller's approach to God that isn't meant to be theologically picked apart and and criticized. Are they just literary tools to tell the narrative? Yeah, I I think that's right. It's just a way of telling a a colorful and lively story about man's interaction with God, and it's told from the human point of view. That's all. For more resources like these from Dr. William Lane Craig, go to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. And thanks for listening to Reasonable Faith with William Lane Craig.